This is the Celtic Soul Podcast. I'm Andrew Millen. It's episode 59, and it's great to be back after our little international break. My guest on the show today will be Jackie Meehan. Jackie witnessed the most successful period in Celtics history from 1965 to 1974 in Glasgow before moving to Canada for a new life. Jackie is the former president of the North American Celtic Supporters Federation, and he is one of the driving forces behind the Celtic conventions in Las Vegas. This episode of the podcast has been kindly sponsored by Tier Own number one Celtic Supporters Club. The club was formed back in 1988 and was the first Celtic Supporters Club in Tyrone. They are based in Haggins Bar in Dungannon, and like many other Celtic Supporters Clubs on this island, they plan and organise trips for members both home and away, domestic and European. Every year they run a number of events to raise money for charities, both locally and nationally. It's a 4am start for them for most matches, as they all get collected and head for the boat to meet the other clubs. Points at 7am and crack the bay, and the slagging always starts on the boat with such opinionated boys. They get into Glasgow for about 12 and usually head for the association to continue the debate and the points. Their day would finish around 11 o'clock when they land back in Dungannon. This year has been tough for all fans and everybody really hopes to get back onto that bus and boat next season for the crack and with the other clubs. And the lads have asked me to thank Aids O'Digny from Aaron Gobra, Jim Greener from Monaghan and Marty Gilmore from Balamina for all the help over the years with tickets and transport. I can vouch for all three and Aids over there from Ergo Bra and Marty from Balamina have been big, big supporters of more than 90 minutes since the early days with sponsorship. So I know exactly where it's coming from, boys. So if you're a selling minded business, a selling supporters club, and you like what we're doing with the podcast and indeed across our independent fan media platform, and you would like to sponsor an episode or put a sponsor in the fans in, please email us at info at or contact us through the website or on social media. And if you're a listener, a reader, or both, and you would like to support our independent Celtic media platform, you can do so by visiting the website where you can become a member, subscribe, buy, or donate for the price of a point. Your support helps us to continue to produce quality independent fan journalism, fanzines, podcasts, video content, and hopefully soon with the vaccine fan events. Keep the comments and suggestions coming in for guests you would like to join us for a chat and let us dig into their Celtic soul. And here's a few comments we received since the last podcast. Hi Andrew, excellent podcast tonight. David Lowe was worth listening to. And that comes in from Johnny Marin, Glaswegian based in Drada. This was a great listen, Andrew. Fair dues. That comes in from Frank Cullen. Thanks, Frank. The Fields of Matt and Roy, great video. Top-notch big man. And not a bad podcast either with David Lowe. And that comes in from Steady Eddie Cantwell in Glasgow. Another fantastic podcast. David certainly knows his stuff. Interesting to hear his insight into meeting with the Celtic board. The Celtic trust sound as if they have got their fingers on the pulse. Enjoyed Ronan's version of the Fields of Atten Roy. I'm looking forward to reading the new edition of More Than 90 Minutes. And I also meant to say, I'm loving the podcast, especially the ones with Kieran, Hilly and Mark. I just finished the two with Paddy McMenamin and they were top class. Could have listened to him all day. I actually wrote an article for the fanzine about supporting Celtic from behind bars, so I found him fascinating. Best of luck with everything you're doing and hopefully normal trips will return next season. Hail, hail, Steve McAvoy. Thanks, Steve. It's been a long time since you wrote that article. Maybe it's about time you penned something and sent it in to us. Hi, Andrew. Been out for a walk this evening and listened to the Johnny Owen podcast. Great stuff. A lot of draw stuff that brought back memories too. As I went to school in the town, I lived in Slane but moved to Drada years later. Living in Kildare now and I get the fancy and off you. I was clearing out my mother's garage in Drada a few weeks ago and found my old Celtic postal since I was a kid. A lot of stuff from the mid 80s. There were four Celtic views from the centenary season. One of them had an article about a cup match feed on Barton and that may be the game you referred to in the podcast. There was also a clip of an article about Nave Porrick meeting Anton Rogan that Mark Bork might like. Keep up the good work. Hail, hail, Jonathan McAvoy. Cheers, Jonathan. I'm going to dig out them images that you sent me and I'll pass them on to Mark and the Nave Porrick boys. So thanks for that. And here's a couple about the fans in. Issue 114 up to its usual high standards of quality. So many highlights and I particularly enjoyed the pieces on Billy McNeil, Patsy Gallagher, Didi Agath and the article about the Celtic Trust by Jeanette Finley. And I comes in from regular commentator Tony Ratton in Sunderland. I've just got my copy of More Than 90 Minutes Celtic Fans in through the post with my lad Daniel McGowan. 
in his first ever Celtic based interview. I'm more than proud of all that, even sitting here with all his world title belts around me. And I can see my very proud father, Paul McGowan. Paul, it was great to have him. Uh, and hopefully we might get him on the podcast or do something on YouTube with him in the future. And we're looking forward to seeing him back in action. And I just want to give a special mention to Mick Kane, who does all our interviews with the fighters, makes a, a boxing and MMA journalist. And it's great that he goes and digs out the Celtic fans for us to put into the fans in. So thanks again, Mick. Folks, keep all those comments coming in. Keep listening and keep reading. Let's hope all the players have returned from international duty, fit and healthy and ready to go. And hopefully Eddie can bring back his French under-21 form and bring it into the Falkirk game as we kick off a Scottish Cup campaign and the defence of the famous trophy. So John Kennedy, no bollocking around. Get the strongest team out and make a statement. And we will be back with Celtic AM after a year away from doing our pre-match live events. We're still in lockdown, so we'll be giving you a virtual show using the technology available to us. So don't forget to log on to our YouTube channel, Celtic Fanzine TV, and subscribe. It's free. And I'll stick up a link so you can just click into it. I'll put it up on the usual platforms. And what a way for Scott Brown to sign off from his time at Celtic with another Scottish medal as he prepares to leave the club for Pastures New in Aberdeen following the exit of Neil Lennon. And now Nick Hammond has left Celtic Park after a disastrous summer transfer window. And we wait now for the appointment of a new head of recruitment, forward slash director of football, along with a new manager. And the wait continues. There's been plenty of rumours, speculation and total bullshit written and spoken about who is going to be the new manager. For me, I'll join the conversation when I see a new manager holding a Celtic scarf over his head. And please God, I might even be able to pick up my winning bet because I did back one of them a couple of months ago. Jackie Meaton left Glasgow in 1974 and he left Celtic behind for a new life in Canada. Jackie is the former president of the North American Federation of Celtic Supporters Clubs and he is one of the driving forces behind the now famous Celtic Convention in Las Vegas. Hi Jackie, you're very welcome to the Celtic Soul podcast. It seems like ages ago since I bumped into you and I think the last time we chatted may have been outside Easter Road about two seasons ago. Yeah, that's, that's correct. I could you let them back every September for a month or so and... Never got this year because you risked COVID, but that's that's just life today. But it's great, Jackie, that you can go back and take in a couple of games because it keeps you in. I suppose it keeps you in with the real feeling of what you must have missed when you left in 1974, standing on the oh. terraces. Oh, for sure, for sure, my leash left. It, it was actually because of the Celtic, I was iffy about leaving. No, but I, I'm glad I did now. I probably made a better decision. Yeah, and it's a huge decision, Jackie, to, you know, to up sticks because we have such an emotional attachment to Celtic. Oh, for sure. Celtic family and the part of your family, you know. But if you hadn't left, we, would, we wouldn't have Las Vegas and we wouldn't have maybe the North American Convention because it's people like you who's who drives these on and every supporters club has them. Everyone that runs a bus has them and every organisation needs people that are going to drive home and put the, the hours and the time in. And sometimes it's thankless and people don't understand the effort that goes in to create events. And even even something small in your supporters club can take a lot of effort. Oh, that's for sure, Malisha. As I say, I was president of St. Catherine's Club for a few years and even just running smaller things. And you know yourself, we're, we're running the, the club and doing different things. There's always a wee snag appears when least expected. No? <laughs> 100%. <laughs> Jackie, um, just to take up this season, it's been a... It's been very disappointing. Uh, a lot of us just want to erase it from the memory. You know, 10 in a row was gone without, without really a big effort from the players. They just seem to have done tools. But Jackie, they have a chance starting this Saturday to redeem themselves and give us something to cheer about for the summer and another Scottish Cup is possible. Oh, I think it's more than possible. Look, to, me, to me, we're still the best team in Scotland. Honestly, I, I do think that. I thought this year was going to be hard because... Everything was going to get put in our way to stop the Ted. Everything. I mean, the referees, the, we had no it goes on every season, but this year it was it was just blatant. They didn't care what anybody says. It was just going to be that way. 
I mean, you look at the suspensions for the COVID, it was hot right away. Game suspended, which put us behind the eight ball. Means we were in catch up right away. Yeah, Jackie, and it's funny, like, like nothing really has changed since you left uh, Glasgow. Uh, when oh it, no, that's when that's it comes to the referees, when I speak to people like John Fallon and Charlie McGinley, the the old school boys, they're so angry. I remember talking to Charlie McGinley after uh, we were beaten by Inverness in the cup. Yeah, and Charlie was calling out decisions and decisions and explaining to me and he was going back years so I was saying to myself well Charlie nothing has changed in, in all the time you've been watching Celtic but I had David Law on the podcast last, last week and he made a great point he said when Fergus McCann was there he stood up to the SFA oh yes all, all over the cadetti stuff you know, and he said that the SFA ripped them off Rent and Hamlin because they knew they were stuck and they knew that they knew they needed somewhere to play and while well, the stadium was redeveloped but maybe and maybe I'm wrong, but maybe Peter Lawwell and the current board are too coy. They should be calling out decisions, and because it seems it seems this season of all seasons, it's the quietest ever that the boardroom has been. Oh, for sure. I mean, look, but we've not said a word about the the disparity in the, the what's happened with their players, our players. I mean, I believe that they get the COVID testing done by a different company for everywhere else in, in, in Britain. No. Well, I can't I confirm that, that, Jack. I don't know if that's true or no, but that's what I've heard. Well, I can't confirm it, but I have heard it too. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to find out. That's, that's, that's a job for me now. I'm going to get me Inspector <laughs> Gadget uh, Investigator badge on. And I'm going to, I, I am going to check it out. Or someone, someone will probably let us know anyway. Right, so... Scottish Cup, Jackie, we have a chance. We play Falkirk on Saturday. And it's funny, we're saying hopefully we beat Falkirk, where normally we would be saying we would probably... By how many? <laughs> yes, Jackie, you, you, we, we definitely would be. I think there's a wee bit of lack of confidence just now. and If we don't get that first goal or get it earlier, the, the panic seems to creep into the game, no? Creep into the players. I mean, there's been a lot of... There's stuff going on in the background I don't understand or I, maybe I never will understand. But we, I've heard all the different rumours about different players or no, don't want to be there. And that, once that gets into your dressing room, that can spread very quickly, the discontent. As Jock Steen always says, to have a happy team, he says, keep the eight guys that don't like you away from the three guys that do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's probably true. Judging by stories <laughs> I've heard, especially, especially off record, Jackie. Jackie, yeah. um, right, Scottish Cup, you, you've seen so many Scottish Cups over the year. But before we go into um, you know, your time in America, can you take us back to Glasgow, you know, growing up, starting to follow Celtic, you know, why Celtic? And just give it myself and the listeners an insight into your time before you emigrated? Yeah, well, I was born in Brigton, so, which is the, as people always say, it must have been a Catholic. It must have been hard being a Catholic growing up in Brigton. It wasn't really, because I went to a Catholic school. A lot of my pals were all Catholics. But I had one pal, uh, Tommy Stevenson, Celtic supporter, who was a Protestant and went to a Protestant school. It was hard for him. Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and as I say, uh, my dad, my uncle Bill, took me to the games very early. The first games I can remember is Celtic and Real Madrid, and uh, when they beat us 3-1 and Celtic came out for a lap of honour because we had played that well. But I was at games before that, but that sticks in my memory, and I don't know why, but I always, always seem to remember a cup tie when we played Gala Ferradine in the cup at Celtic Park. <laughs> I don't know just with that name, but I always remember that. <laughs> that that's a mouthful. Um, yeah, Jackie. See, you grew up in Brighton. The, is the you know what's there now where you grew up? Because I know I know the Brighton area now. I, I normally walk through it quite quickly. Yeah. Well, I was born in James Street, right across the road from the Mermaid above Burns's Bar, and then uh, I moved to Castle Milk, and then my mother was in the hospital for. 18 months with TB and I went back to stay with my granny in Brigton so I went, I've been back to school there for a couple of years and then when I moved to Casamil I was just jumped on the bus with all the local guys to go down to Celtic Park no? but it's always been 
what a family thing. The whole family, my grandfather, everybody. Just it was just Celtic. It's a way of life. It's it's not just a way of life. It's to me, it's how you live your life. It's a passion. No, it's something that you should, as a Celtic supporter, you should cherish it. No. Yeah, we're doing it. We're doing a cup final um, virtual Celtic AM on Saturday for, for the game, and and David Pot was on, and he was on giving us like a, a history lesson, basically. But he he goes back to the, the turning point when you would have been growing up as well in Celtic's fortunes, which he puts down to the 1965 Scottish Cup final after Jack Steen arrived and and changed things. Can, can you remember that, Jackie? Can I remember it? It was my 12th birthday, 24th of April, 1965. And I was, I remember sitting talking to Bertie Old in Vegas and we were talking about it because Bertie, Bertie agrees that was a big turning point for Celtic. So we were talking about the game and I says, and Bertie says, I scored two goals. I says, oh, I know, I remember. But I says, because Harry Melrose scored for them and then you equalised. And then John McLaughlin scored again and then you equalised. And then Big Billy scored in the, in the 81st minute. And he says, how do you remember that? Well, even who scored for them? I said, well, Bert, it was my 12th birthday. I'm never going to forget that day. <laughs> wow, Jackie, that, that's, that was, that's some bad present. And nobody knew what was going to follow. You know, oh, you, no, no, oh. no. And even uh, the following year when we won the league at, at Motherwell, it was just, like, I find myself very lucky, right? When I was 12, up to the left, I seen Celtic win nine in a row. And then from the left, the, the Huns won it the following year. No? So, <laughs> As I say, I was very lucky in my time of following Celtic, and I followed them everywhere. Right, but I think the first game I missed in about six years was we played the Huns on the Saturday at Hamden. It was a twelve o'clock kickoff because of the power shortage thing, and then straight from Hamden we went to Manchester for Bobby Charlton's testimonial. And the following week it was Glasgow September weekend, so we just decided to stay down. And Celtic played a League Cup tie in the Wednesday night or the Thursday against Wraith Rovers or Sunday. And that was the first one I'd missed in years. <laughs> Unbelievable, Jackie. And listen, when you just mentioned there, you were sitting in Las Vegas chatting to Bertie Ald about the 1965 Cup final, when you, which was your 12th Bertie. How good is that? You know, because can you imagine when you were 12, Jackie, that years later, you were going to sit with a goal-scoring hero in Las Vegas of all places? It's, yeah, it's magical. the thing is, Belish, that, a lot of people say, well, what do you get out of it? But these guys were my heroes and most of them ended up good friends. <laughs> well, I mean, I've been in, like, Jimmy, Jinky says, Bobby Murdoch was my favourite player, always will be. He made Celtic as far as I'm concerned and I still keep in contact with Kathleen. And as I say, if you're going for heroes to, to friends, it's it's amazing, no? And the, 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 the most down-to-earth, superheroes that you'll ever meet no? <laughs> they are Jackie I've been lucky enough to interview most of them and that's the first thing that, that hits you is how normal they are because yes. sometimes I see players now and you know they won't even stop to, to sign a kid's you know jersey or they, they take a picture but they can't get away quick enough I remember in well, they, they all just walk by you with a headset on right no, the headphones on yeah whether they're listening to anything or no, I don't care. Like they've just got the headsets on just for that for that look. Yeah, when you think, Jackie, that these players from from that era before you moved to Canada and, and after up until up until we moved to Lennox Town, when you think of it, these players were were walking along the street to training. So, oh yeah, they walked along to Barrowfield no? <laughs> and stopped for. A lot of them stopped for a pie or a sausage roll the way back. <laughs> isn't it, isn't it? And then they were done and win the European Cup. Yeah. When I started to follow Celtic, Jackie, if they were they were barren years. It wasn't like we didn't oh, have yeah. much, we didn't have much I, success. And I would listen to you know, especially the old guys on the boat telling me about sixty seven and the nine in a row, and it was just a distant dream. But I can't believe now that I've seen nine in a row. I've seen a quadruple treble, and I also seen Celtic play in the European final. We didn't win. Yes. But what I've been, as I say, I've beat you two finals and lost two, so that I've not. <laughs> but, but I'll tell you, Seville is still one of the best weeks of my life. Oh, amazing! I was listening. To, I was listening to a podcast um, from the Homeboys uh, walking this week, and there was a guy talking about he didn't go to Seville, and uh, he said he was raging. You know, could see all his mates there. He said as the week went on, you know, it just grew. It was. 
for me, we stayed in Ben and Medina, like two and a half hours away from Seville. And just the build up was just brilliant. But it was also a huge come down, Jackie. Oh, yeah. It was, it, as I say, it was disappointing, but we left there with a lot of pride and a really good name for the club. Yeah, of course. We, we, so we won awards for Jackie, first time on Yeah. So, so then, Jackie, yeah, nine in a row, you got to say goodbye to Celtic Park and you emigrate. Tell me about, you know, finding a new life and settling in and how did you how did you keep in contact and how did you get the results? Oh, well, it was shortwave radio and phone calls. Uh, I remember the, the 4-2 game between the 10 men won the league. I listened to that over the phone with my brother, no, my brother telling me about it over the phone. The shortwave radios, I say, even when we started the St. Catherine's Club, when we played Real Madrid and we beat them 2 0 at Celtic Park, and then the return game, it was it was on here about one in the afternoon in a working day. We had close to 60 in the club listening into it over a shortwave. <laughs> Unbelievable, Jackie. And it's not that long ago that we were watching games on teletext over here. So, like, social media yeah. and the, the way everything... I always laugh when my mate Hilly tells me about... He gave us ticket away for the 5-1 game under Dr. Joe. And Luba, Luba's big, big start in that game. But he says, I watched the game on teletext in the pub. And I tried, <laughs> and he says, and when, we, when, when I knew we'd won the game... He, he says, I drank every shot on the on the obstacles or whatever you call them when the, the bottle hangs up. And I said, but but, but that's only the, you know, the late 90s. Like, how far have we come, Jackie, in recent years? Like, it's 24-7 Celtic now, which is a good thing. But it also, we have to put up with some amount of bullshit and rumours and lawyers as well. Because, oh. <laughs> you know, everybody everybody seems to know who the manager's going to be. Yeah, well, if... if- if, if I knew for sure, there'd be a lot of money on it, right? So I've heard all the rumours myself. and you know, like Last week, when I got told it was Eddie Howe, he was 17 to 1 and now he's 25. No, if I knew, if I knew that was a, a gimme, I'd have put the house on it, right? So, but nobody knows. And the way I look at it with Celtic, anybody that's talking about it, I'll, I'll not be getting it. Well, well, maybe that's your, you could be right, Jackie. You could be right because they seem to do their business quietly than they have done on the yeah, past, well, number, past number of I mean, With the names that are kicking about and the three that seem to be quite prominent is Roy Keane, Eddie Howe, and the boy from Man City. Well, I'm sure the Scottish press have all got their phone numbers. You've not heard a peep for any of the three of them. Yeah, true. I, I, I'll be honest, Jackie. I, I, I don't like the whole speculation thing. I find it, I find it quite boring when there's, you know, there's other stuff to talk about. But I did back Eddie Howe a couple of weeks ago. I just thought, you know what, he might just fit the bill. And I just, anyone that asked, I said, look, I just fancied a little punt on him. And I backed him. I said, because I was toned off by all the rumours. So now I have a little interest in it. Yeah, but well, if, that's it. Now you've got an interest. Eh? But if a, a better man comes along, that Celtic think is a better man. I don't mind losing me a couple of quid. I can't say the same for Connor Jackie because he, I told him to put it on on his account. And <laughs> so he, as he, long as you paid him. No, I did, but he doubled it up. So now every day he's saying, what's the story on Eddie Howe? You know, so, uh, look, we will see. Jackie, um, Canada, I want to go back to Canada. Uh, as you said, you made your home and from the radio to the St. Catherine's Club, how did the Federation come come about, and how did getting the games beamed into clubs come about? Well, the, I'd say that the, in '84 they had, uh, or '94 was it? '94 they had the uh, Hamilton Cup, and it was Celtic, Aberdeen, Hearts, somebody else, and we, the, we, there was supporters clubs. I knew there was the, the, the Scarborough Club, the Toronto Club, Bramley, uh, Burlington, Hamilton. Because we used to get together sometimes for, and when tapes were sent over to the games. So that when we, were, when we started talking about getting a wee kind of... It wasn't just started out to be the North American Federation. It was just clubs for Ontario. We says, right, we'll get together. And with satellite, was starting to come in the, uh, the 99 Cup, Joe Miller Cup final. Well, we had all watched that together in the Irish Centre in Hamilton. It was, or in Toronto. It was only shown at the one place. 
And after that, I think the satellite company was CNC or something like that. We started dealing with them. And as five or six clubs getting a better price for bringing it in and getting it to our own places rather than or traveling to the one place together. So as I say, like, I'd say about, but 94, we, we say, right, we'll try and start a wee kind of federation for the clubs in Ontario and other clubs like, like Durham, London, Sarnia. And then the word kind of spread. And then with Kearney and the States, uh, New York, San Francisco, LA. So like, we say, well, even better, we'll make it a North American federation. <laughs> And and it started for there, and the first meeting we really had was probably 94 or 95 in Bramalee, and there was maybe eight or nine clubs for Ontario, and I believe there was Joe Cook and Larry Brown came up for LA, and... Joe wouldn't miss a session. <laughs> no, no, Joe wouldn't miss a session. <laughs> and uh, I think Richard McKenna came up for San Francisco, and then that went, and then the following year, 96, by that time we were up to about maybe 30 clubs between Canada and America, and the boys for LA says, what about having a, a we do in Vegas? So we went for that, and most people just came for the four days, but we would went down for a week just to help set it up, and we'd actually flew down at our own expense and met the boys for LA there, you look at hotels and talk to people. And as I see it just grew from there. And I think in 96, we brought over, I think, seven or eight players. Uh, Jackie, can I, I just stop you there? Do, do, before the actual convention, you, you met the boys from LA in, in, in Vegas. Like, no, yeah, yeah. But, but, and had a, had no, a bit of a party. Them, I'd met them in Bramalee, as I say, when they came up for the first kind of meeting that we had. And then they, they suggested. What about having a do in Vegas? So we made arrangements to meet them down there and then go look at hotels and things like that. And, and yes, we did have a few beers while we were there. <laughs> <laughs> and the first official convention was in Vegas. Was it 96, yeah? Yes, 96. And we had Chalmers Old. I can still remember them. Chalmers Old, Fallon, Jinky, uh, Bobby Murdoch. Oh, and Stuart Gray, we brought over and all. We always tried, at that time, we always tried to bring over a, a young kid. I don't know if you remember Stuart Gray, Eddie Gray's kid. Yeah, yeah. And Mike Galloway, I believe, came that year and all. So, so Jackie, so 1996, uh, first convention, that was, was that in the Imperial Palace? Imperial Palace, yeah. And yeah, many yeah. people turned up. Uh, but by the time the weekend came, about 350. And were they all from... Now, the America, or did anyone from this side of the, the world travel over? The, I believe the first one, I think, yeah, I think uh, Danny Riley, Ricky Fearon, and Jim Divers for the association then came. Yeah, there was three from, from overseas there, and yeah, they were the first ones that really came. And, and obviously, obviously, world spread, Jackie, because I, I'm a kind of a bit lost about the ones in between the, the Vegas years. Was the one the following year somewhere else, or was the next one two years later? No, the next one was 67, the 30th anniversary. That's when we brought the whole 12 of the Lions, plus Joe McBride, Molly O'Neill, Charlie Gallagher, John Oh, Hughes, brilliant. So you brought the whole Sean, squad? Yeah, and, Sh and Sean Fallon too. Oh, amazing. I can imagine Sean Fallon in Las Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's class. And you know, at this stage, I hadn't a clue that you know this, this was going on. I didn't know, yeah. you know, Vegas was happening. But it wasn't until 2000, Jackie, that I made me, me way over. Your debut. <laughs> I made me debut. Uh, a couple of us went over. It, it was bonkers. We, we ended up in Santa Monica for a day on the beer. Uh, we, we, oh, it was brilliant. And then we arrived in Vegas late at night. Now, we were staying downtown. There wasn't even a swimming pool in the hotel. It was, <laughs> it was like... I was expecting to be on the strip, but the lads that booked, they booked us into this place. But look, we had a great time and we went up for the dinner and that. But boy, Jesus, Jackie, I'll never forget the heat at that dinner in that car park. Oh, no, that was that was in uh, the New Frontier. Yeah, well, that was a great spot as well. Yeah, I, well, I've enjoyed them all. I mean, when people ask me my favourite one, I always have to say the first one because 
We did enough that we'd work in it. That ah, it's brilliant. And, and look what it's grown to from, you know, 300, 350 people. But yeah. in that car park, like, there was, there was a few eye opens for me that time in Vegas because Vegas was a little different then as well. There was still some of the oh, old yeah. casino, the old casinos there, and you could still get. You could still get drunk fairly cheap and you could yeah, eat fairly cheap. A, I mean, I remember it was a dollar a beer. And, no. Yeah, stuff like that. But the the, the, the one thing that sticks out, Jack, you know, I had, a, I had a couple of bills in the sun before we went to the dinner. Oh. <laughs> and, and I just want to pour in record. I, you know, I didn't have any drugs, okay? But I thought I wasn't drugs. I was sitting there in the heat or maybe I thought I had sunstroke and a fella passed me on a horse. <laughs> and they had me, had me about to have me dinner. And that man was Hugo Strainy. Yeah. And that is my everlasting memory of the first dinner <laughs> dance in Las Vegas. As I say, like the, it started to spread then, because I think it was 97, it we had a couple of boys from Australia came at first. Uh, Frank Campbell and his brother-in-law, Ian McKinnon. And it turned out that kind of helped, because when Frank was there, he took a really bad turn and he had to have a heart operation. And uh, his family flew over from Australia. And uh, Tam Donnelly went to the hotel. And I think, you know, Tam, uh, Tam Brown beat them into giving the family a suite for as long as it took at no charge. And the hotel did. So uh, I still think a lot of people would just worry. But Tam, still, you think you're the wee things that can really help, you know? Yeah. 100%. And he went there, and as I say that, the, the Australian boys, once Frank had recovered and went home, the word spread over there too. You know? Yeah, it truly Frank is an international event. Hell, sorry, to, you know. oh, sorry to hear that. Jackie, it truly is an international event now. When you hear Hugo on stage at the dinners and he's calling out people from Russia and... Oh, no. That, no that, uh, that, was a, and, that was a classic. That, there wasn't actually anybody there for Russia, if you know the whole story, Malish. He was asking people who would get married where they were from, and the guy told them, and you go in, and we've we'll even got somebody from Russia, <laughs> somebody whispered in his ear, Hugo, it's Russia. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant, brilliant. But I have to say, Jackie, there's, you know, thousands and thousands of people there waiting, waiting for the buffet to start, and I must be the record breaker. I've been forced in the queue every time, every time for that buffet. To tell you the truth, Malish, it's only in the last few I've always I've ate because before I was too nervous with how things were going. And <laughs> yeah, Jack, Jack, you know, I, I I walk in the event game and I, I just can imagine the stress of of, of something as big as Vegas um, because we've done stuff and even last year when we done Thailand in the pandemic, it was like yeah, as I say, something comes in and, and throws a as I say, a snags always happen. Yours was a big snag. If I well, 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 Jackie, you know, we plan for every, we plan for everything, but you know, it's up to the pandemic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I tell you one thing, Jackie, and I really appreciate it. I got a lovely text from yourself, just wishing us well. You know, it was it was medical advice I was looking for at that stage. <laughs> but it was lovely, and I, and I really appreciate it coming from you. But hopefully we'll get back as well. We just have to make sure that, you know, we're, we're not clashing with Vegas, because obviously, with, with, with Vegas being cancelled, Jackie, this year and happening next year, are you going to do it the following year, or are you going to wait for another two years? We might, we might need... I'm not sure, because as I say, I'm not on the committee anymore, although I still help it, but... Uh, the reason we changed to the odd years was because of like, getting players. See, back then, like, new players only get three, four weeks off, so it's going to always be hard to get a present day player, right? But uh, I'm not 100% sure on that, so I wouldn't like to answer that and throw somebody bad information. Malik. Yeah, yeah. No, no bother, Jackie. It's just I remember when it came out, because it, it was always a toss up. I, you know, I wanted to go to Japan and Korea, but I just, I just hadn't the, the money, and we ended up going to Vegas, and we watched two of the games, the two of the Ireland games there in the New Frontier, and it was absolutely brilliant. So yeah, Arabia, and um, and it was funny. There was a band dance on before the match the, against. Yeah, that's right. it, it, yeah, no. it, 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 You couldn't make it up, like you know. And I, as I say, I wasn't on drugs. I was at a band dance. Listen to country music and fiddles before Ireland played Spain. That was 2000, Malika. Yeah, and, but, and then when it came out of sync, Jackie, um, it was great because I was able to go to the Euros, you know, and it wasn't clashing with, with a Celtic thing. And then 
Last year, I remember saying to Declan, I don't know if I'm going to go because if I don't qualify for the Euros, you know, there's going to be games in Dublin. But now that's obviously was put back a year and, yeah. every, you know, everything's getting everything's getting mixed up and that. But anyway, we will get over this, Jackie, and we will get back travelling again. And hopefully next year, we'll all be celebrating, celebrating champions again and, and drinking pints. And, and like you were saying, talking earlier about being, I remember the dollar of drink days, but Vegas got took over by corporate where before. As one guy explained it to us, he says, when Vegas was ran by and he bent his nose so you could take it, what he meant by that, the mob, he says, you could go see Frank Sinatra for $10. And he says, but now it's corporate America. They want a profit off everything. Well, the mob, they took the profit for the gambler. Everything else was thrown in as freebies. He says, but corporate America... They want a profit off the food, the rooms, the drink, everything. No. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard that. I, I actually, it was a taxi driver that told me that. He was telling me stuff about, he was telling me the history of Vegas one day in a taxi. Now, maybe he was lying to me and he wanted an extra fare because it did say to him, go up the strip again so I get the rest of this story. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, as I said, Jackie, hopefully we'll be back. But there, there has been other, you know, away from Vegas as well, there has been other um, conventions. Conventions, yeah. We've well, had the... Uh, We've had two in Bramalee. Uh, we had Victoria out in Van, uh, Victoria Island out in British Columbia. Uh, the two in San Francisco have been fantastic. But then again, San Francisco is my favourite American city. So it's San Francisco, then Boston, then New York. And my. <laughs> and, and there's been nothing on the East Coast because of the expense of it, is it? Exactly. I mean, we've asked Boston and New York, uh, but they were saying for you get hotels, you're not going to get hotel deals the way you get in Vegas. Right? Yeah, yeah. He yeah says, for you for you to go for a week, you'd be thousands in America, no? Yeah, because we've gone over to the Plowboys gigs in, in Philly and they were saying that they do get a good rate in the hotel, but there they was, you know, there's only a certain day to book the rate. Yeah. I've been, that, I've been down to the Philly one a few times, but the thing is that the last few, uh, the last three, I think, have fell on my anniversary, so Usually I'm away somewhere warm in February. <laughs> Isn't it well for you? Us freezing our balls off in Philadelphia and you sending us pictures on cruises and the Caribbean. <laughs> but Jackie, you de- you deserve that. And if you don't deserve it, your lovely wife Anne definitely deserves it. Now listen, I was, uh, there's two I want to just mention. I, I went to the Windsor Convention and it was absolutely, yes. it was absolutely brilliant. A young yeah. Ke- a Kevin Bridges made his debut. I don't know whatever happened to him, but someone said he done well. <laughs> He's a boxing Celtic pack. But I also got I also got to go into Detroit and uh, I visited two places I always wanted to visit. I wanted to visit Motown, and that, yeah. and that was brilliant. And then Big Rick, shout out to Big Rick, fair play to him. He took myself and Nasha and the girls down to uh, the Cronks Gym, which is gone now. Yeah, in, in a in a quite a rough part of Detroit. And Celine, Nash's wife Celine, was panicking in the back of the car because you know it was it was a bit it was a bit hairy wet driving through. And Rick says to me, he says, "No, I didn't know Rick at the time." He says, "We just popped the glove box down. I popped the glove box, and there was a big gun in it." And he says to me, he said, "Show that to Celine." I said, "I'm not touching a gun." <laughs> he says, "Tell her we'll be okay. I'll bring the gun with me." But we were <laughs> we were welcomed into the gym. I met Milton McCrory, the former world welterweight champion, Jackie. So, like, without the convention, I never would have got to Detroit. No, yeah, I, we'll just say, I, I had an auntie stayed in Detroit, so I'd been there quite a few times. Eh, so. Some spot and and like chalk and cheese from Windsor. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You know. see, like, there's there's a few of the. There used to be a big Scottish contingent, Irish contingent in Detroit, but that was years and years ago because they all went there for the car factories, like, you know. Yeah, yeah, of course. And there's another one, Jackie, I was in that, but I, I tell you, I was, I was uploading back issues onto the website of the fanzine and I was flicking through them to see what was in them. And I came across the, the New Orleans convention, which I didn't attend. And yes. that, was, that was after the disaster, wasn't it? Yes, after the the, hur- the hurricane down there, eh, Katrina. Will, will, will you just tell us a little bit that and, and, and about the, that club and how they come back and how you've helped them? And- oh, well, they, they, that club done tremendous to bounce, to bounce back. The place they showed, the pub at the show, the game had been flooded. And there's forties out there of them just after it, like, just where we tell he stuck and talk at a table while we were salvaging what was left of their business. No, like to, to fight back for that, 
And in saying that, a lot of the clubs made donations to help them. And that's another thing I'm very proud of with the Federation. That over the years, and we don't advertise it a lot. We don't advertise it a lot. But over the years, we've gave to a lot. A like, couple of young Celtic supporters that get murdered after Rangers games. We raised up quite a lot of money for two families. We've, but probably the biggest was after 9-11. And we asked all the clubs to have a collection and we'd make a, a donation. And the total came to, I think it was just under 60,000 that we donated to the New York Police and Firemen's Widows Association. That was, that was a, a proud moment. No? Brilliant. And correct me if I'm wrong, it was the first convention in Vegas after 9 11, also in the frontier in the Marquee. With the, the chief of police spread the Kearney branch carried the American flag. I, I remember uniform, anyway. I remember yeah, so I, in uniform. I, and I believe Tommy Love's son from LA wore his army his, his marine uniform. So. I, I I do remember that. I remember um those those kind of I remember uniforms. But I'd say that was the best dinner dance I ever attended in Vegas because yeah. we had to cast the river dance. Yes, yes. <laughs> and there was, a, there, was a, there, was, there was a girl from the dog and, and a boy from my hometown in, in the cast, and it was great, to, great to meet him and that. But I think, I think that one sticks out to me as the as the the best dinner dance I was at. It was, it was. Yeah. I think one of the boys got married as well, and, and you know we were really celebrating that week. And seeing that the uh, the lead male dancer in the river dance there in Vegas was a boy from Govan Hill in Glasgow. And he says, just think, 14 months ago, I was crawling under floorboards and Govan Hill as a plumber. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and, and I'm not sure if it is the lad, but one of the lads from um, from the cast, and he could have been the main dancer, he's a Glasgow boy, he actually married he married a lad I walked with daughter. She's a, she's a Libyan-Irish girl. And she was uh, also... Bro- he was also probably, the uh, probably the same boy. Yeah, it's because it's a small world. I remember after the Player of the Year awards one year, bumping into his brother, and he was another Irish dancer. So, like, you, you wouldn't want to be telling lies anywhere, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> the, the people I've met through it, with friends from all over the world, yourself included. I mean, that's it's it's expanded everything. With friends, I mean, I can go to Australia somewhere to stay, go to islands, and I, I've stayed with Eki and Maria. And the Madhouse, no, nope. yeah, and I like, mean, some of the characters I've met, like Richard McKenna from San Francisco, who passed away. Like Richard is, oh, Richard was just a a pure gentleman, right? No, a pure gentleman in every sense of the word. And like, the boys on the committee, like the first committee was myself, Tom, Jimmy Maguire passed away now, Pat McGauley for the Scarborough Club, and Harry Air for the Hamilton Jocks team. And then look, we've had Mike Boyd. Mike's been on it forever, the quiet man, Jimmy Maguire. And look, Peter Milligan, to me, Peter doesn't get any recognition. Peter does more than most. Eh? And he never seems to get recognised, Peter. And I always, and him and Mike, look, they do so much work in Vegas. It, it's not a holiday for them, no. It's not, it's not a time away. It's just a time of stress for them. Yeah, of course. And look, as I say, look, as I say, Peter and Mike, I don't think they get the recognition they deserve. No. Well, it's nice for you to give it to them here, Jackie. As I say, like the, I've had some laughs there. My, I've had great guests. My best guest ever in my eyes was Neil Lennon, who I'd love to get to come to the next one. And uh, I don't like to run anybody down, and I'm not really running them down, but Sean Collins, he was a bit of prick. <laughs> 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 Just on the two players you mentioned, Jackie, Neil Lennon was the last, we'll say, first team player to yes. attend the convention. And he was absolutely brilliant that week. He was around oh. that pool every day. He was in the bar every night. He was so professional. Yes. He, repre- he represented the club brilliantly. You know, and, and, and in a time of smartphones and that, nobody could show anger with Neil Lennon then. And he's also done the same, Jackie, for Air Supporters Club. We met him. We yeah. met him in the airport one day. He was coming home after a game, and we asked him, "Would he attend a, a function for cancer?" Thinking that you know we'd never hear from him again. But not only did we not hear from him, he came and he came again and he came again and he supported. You know, and 
Scott Brown's going to leave now, and I was looking for I was looking for Scott Brown's jersey for a function I was doing for the Kano Foundation in Glasgow. Lenny was reserve manager, and he sorted it out for me. You know, so like uh, well, a decent you know, a decent bloke has took a lot of stick this year. Um, oh, it's it's been unreal the stick he's took, and it's not just this year. Like, especially right now, when all we're getting is racism, racism, racism. Where were we off when Neil was getting it weekly, daily? Yeah, a hundred percent. 100% Jackie and as you say he's, he's, he's so professional that that convention you're talking about he came to me before the dinner dance and said Jackie is it okay if I get drunk tonight I says fill your boots Neil you've been tremendous Yeah. and another wee side like that as you said Malish he was in round about the pool at the bar shaking hands photographs four nights in a row we says to him what are you doing tonight Neil nothing because nobody thought uh, he would be on his own, so he was nobody had says to him. So he came out with us for for dinner nearly every night, and then in the Wednesday night, I, I, you laughed at this one. I think I told you it before. Lindsay says to him, "What are you doing tonight, Neil?" He went, "Oh, nothing." Lindsay she says, "Would you mind watching the kids?" <laughs> <laughs> we, we 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 were on a stag party. We've actually had two stag parties at the um, convention. And we were at Gavin's one, and when we we got back about seven in the morning, I think he was getting up to go for his breakfast, and he says, "Was where where is?" And I was just, "Oh, brilliant! We're having a steak party. We've been everywhere in Vegas." And uh, his words were choice to us for not inviting him. But I said, <laughs> I, "I said, look, Lenny, if this had to go back to Glasgow, what we were up to, you would have been sacked." Yeah. Oh, I know. I know. Did, did you see with the with these phone cameras everywhere? Yeah. Were you the one for Stuart Pearson went in the pool? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, I was surprised. We asked everybody, if you filmed that, please delete it. And I was surprised that nothing ever came out of that. Yeah. Jackie, when I do do the nights, okay, I sell the AM, we record them. But when I do the nights in Malone's or when I do a player event, wherever we do it, I ask people to take their pictures before they get, before we start talking. And then yes. I ask them to switch them off. No videos. We don't record it. No, we could record it and put it out, you know, and we get yeah. loads of listeners and that. But because there's a lot said in them interviews, you a want the tales re- in the dressing room. Yeah, a guy's reputation is worth more than a couple of extra listeners. A hundred percent, Jackie, a hundred percent. And the other one, right, I, will you, I know the John Collins story. Will you share it with the listeners? Oh, it was just that. Uh, it was always... The whole time he was there, he just seemed as if he didn't want to be there. And then uh, he mentioned that, somebody mentioned to us that he was thinking of going back early because he had been contacted by, I think it was French TV, he was playing in France at the time to go back and commentate on some of the World Cup games. And it, it, it kind of pissed a lot of people off, just, just with his general attitude. And then we heard on the plane on the way home, he'd, he was sitting and he'd mentioned myself and Tam Donnelly and but wasn't he complimentary about it and but it was lucky enough the guy sitting behind him was a friend of Tam so he let him know. But as I say like, when he says he met I met him like, I think it was the morning he was leaving and he says uh, I don't think I'd, I'd I'd ever come back and I says to him quite bluntly, you don't need to fucking worry about it, you'll never be invited back. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean it was that uh, I mean, other people will have good stories about John. I'm only giving you... Uh, yeah, but you'll be, my, on, you'll, you'll be honest. I, um, I, that might have been... Was that the year Neil Lennon was there? It probably was, yeah. yeah because I'll tell you who was there as well. Tosh was there, because we had a great crack with Tosh. Yeah, well, see, Tosh was kind of hanging about with him, and Tosh changed completely once he was away. No, you know Tosh. Tosh is Celtic through and through. Uh, I remember Tosh walking by. We were all at the Splash Bar, which which was basically... It was like the Gallagher in Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, but that's that's where I actually had my first session with you, Jackie. I think we drank a bottle of Bacardi um, <laughs> or, or, or maybe two. But <laughs> Tosh was coming in one night late and, you know, as you know, Tosh isn't a drinker. And um, Tomo, was it Tomo or Timo? Timo from from from, from Dublin, from Nave Park, was standing there and Tosh came up and he was chatting to us and Timo says, he says, oh, Tosh, he says, you know, he says, he says, I called, I called my dog after you. 
<laughs> I said to me, fucking hell, I, I mean, Carl Moss, he says, you know, a dog. I, I, I mean, we got, we got this story of, of this dog and it was just, you know, just drink, you know, a couple of drinks and, and a bit of crack. But yeah, and Tosh is, Tosh is wonderful. He's probably the best after dinner speaker I've ever heard. Yeah, because even with the, you're saying that we, who was there earlier, the, the help that we had from overseas, like right now, John Andrews is a big help to yourself. Michael Kelly for the association was one of the first guys I dealt with with the association. Another gentleman, as I said, Robert Finnegan was great. I don't know if you knew Robert. Robert passed away. A lot, not a lot of the Irish boys know Robert because he was very friendly and over in Ireland a lot. Robert was probably my first big kind of liaison with the association. And Robert would out his way for members for North America. In so many ways, I remember one boy told me, he asked Robert, could he get his boy a ticket for some game? And Robert says, I sure. And he says, well, where can he meet you? Because he's only flying in that morning to Edinburgh Airport. Well, Robert got somebody for one of the Edinburgh clubs to pick a boy up at the airport and then bring him to Selling Park to meet him for the ticket. No. Uh, that's just and Celtic fear. And as the saying goes about, what they say is about Robert Finnegan and... Uh, Paul Heskey was very good friends with Robert too. And me and Heskey re- reminisce about Robert any time we're together. And uh, as the saying goes, it says, if you get to heaven and you find out you need a ticket to get in, just ask for Finney. He's the man. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I've just got, it's brilliant, Jackie, to, to reminisce. You know, I, I, there's so many memories coming back into my own head. Uh, like, and you, you said there about the people we meet and the friendships that are made. You know, like these events are way, because like, when we go to, to Celtic Park, you know, the chances are limited because there's 60,000 of us. And we're, yeah. all, we're all in different pubs and we're in our little groups and on our supporters' buses. But when we go to an event like, like Las Vegas or even a smaller event like in Thailand, even though we were going through a pandemic, the new friends I've met that I'm in contact yeah. with now, you know, and, and one of the girls that, w- that was there, she's having, she's gone through treatment for cancer now since she went back, you know. And we, we raised a couple of quid. and So there's, there's people you, you wouldn't have met and they were the life and soul of the party. And then you find out that they're, they're dealing with yeah, something like this now. And I, I, I won't mention them just, just in case they, they don't want to be mentioned, you know? Yes, um, I understand. But we are, we are and it's, it's, it's kind of a cliche, but we are, we, we are a bit of a family. Oh, for sure, for sure. And I think that, I was trying to think uh, this morning for I knew I was going to be talking to you, how many ex-players we've had over, and I think that like, there's a lot of them are regulars, right? The Lions, like, if any of the Lions want to come any year, they're, they're there, right? So, I think we've had about 40 different ones over. Right? Some of are Celtic through and through. Like, uh, I remember we had the young boy, John Paul McBride. We had uh, Malky Mackay came as a youngster, I know. Charlie Gallic and another gentleman that's there. Dixie Dean, Dixie's another one. It's well, Dixie's, Dixie's on bed, his coattails when it comes to going to Vegas. And George McCluskey isn't far behind him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, Jackie, the late Pat McCluskey. Oh, Pat. Pat is, Pat's one of my favourite people. So kind and gentle as a person and funny and unconsciously funny at, at some. I remember in San Francisco, me, him and somebody else had been out on the bar and then the golf was the next day and he was actually golfing with my brother and when they come off the golf course, Pat says to him, God sake, Terry, was I sick out there because I've lost my false teeth? <laughs> 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 so when Jerry comes in, he says, Pat thinks he's lost his false teeth. I says, tell him he never, he never had them in this morning when I picked them up. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I can name a few more. I remember Jamie Smith being there. Was it Jamie Smith? Yeah, Jamie Smith, yeah. Tommy Coyne. Yeah, oh, Tommy Coyne, yeah, Tommy, yeah. there's, yeah. A, there's been a, a couple. I think I broke Tommy's, Tommy Coyne's heart talking about Ireland games too. Yeah. And also, even in 2007, we brought all the Lions that were still still with us, but we also brought uh, Agnes Johnson, Kathleen Murdoch, and Rosemary Simpson. That's a lovely, lovely gesture. And but what I always remember was, I'd met Kathleen and uh, Agnes before, and I says to them, would you 
mind, like keeping a wee eye on Rosemary, because Rosemary was a wee bit older. And after two days, the boss of them says, could you get somebody else? We can't keep up with us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus, that's brilliant. Thank you. Now, I've, I always get all my guests to climb into my time machine. Uh, and I, I wanted to bring me, if, I wanted to pick a moment from the convention and I wanted to bring me back then to a time of, of actually watching Celtic in the flesh and also of a time when you got together in America to watch them. So I wanted to bring up three things from my time machine. So let's start with, let's start with, pick a moment from all the conventions. For all the conventions, uh, oh, it'd be hard. Or oh, maybe my daughter, my granddaughter carrying the flag the Champions League flag with all the team and doing the huddle with all the, the Lions. Oh, that's and lovely. I think she was, Kiba was maybe 13 or 14 at the time, no? Maybe not even that's... that old, maybe 12. That was, that was very, very good. And the first one, just meeting them all, meeting Bobby Murdoch, as, we, as I say, Bobby Murdoch was my hero and favourite and always will be. Like, when Bobby played Celtic play, that was just that simple. Yeah. As Barry Old says, He's probably the best player I've ever played with. He could head the ball, tackle, pass the ball, score, he did everything. It's funny, every one of the lines that I interviewed and some of the players that played with him later in life um, always say that Bobby was the engine. He was the man. Jimmy was, yeah, the, well, enter- Jimmy was the entertainer, but Bobby was the man. And when you think of the quality that was throughout that team, but the biggest compliment I've ever heard about, um, a strange one as well, about Bobby, came from an unlikely source. It came from Graeme Souness. Yeah. He, he played as a young midfielder with him at Middlesbrough under, under, under Jack Charlton. And yes. um, he speaks, he speaks about how, so maybe Jock let Bobby go too early. Oh, for sure. Well, Bobby had the weight problem and he had to, he used to go to Middlesbrough in a health battle, right? And I think that was, plus when Jackie Charlton couldn't wait to get him there because actually Ersom Park was the biggest playing area in Britain. Park-wise, and he knew Murdoch could pass people off the park, you know? I yeah. said, see, I've got a neighbour around the corner, Middlesbrough fan, and says he's the best player he's ever seen play for Middlesbrough. That wouldn't be hard, Jackie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry if there's any Middlesbrough, if there is a Middlesbrough fan listening. Okay, yeah. Jackie, I, that's, that, that's your Vegas one, right? Yeah. A, a moment when you were actually on the terrace or in the stand. Well, as I say there, 65 Cup final. As I say, in the stand, I, I never sat in a seat to, after I went back to here. And, and, <laughs> uh, I'd say that the 65 Cup final, Seville, even although we lost the game, Seville will always be special to me, you know? Oh, hell, hell, Jackie, hell, hell. 2003, what a... And then the other one that always sticks my mind was uh, AC Milan. That's when I still stayed at home. I went over to Milan and been to Glasgow. I'd never been anywhere before. We've all got the T-shirts and, and all the Italian fans done was hit us with snowballs. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, is that the game that um, I remember reading the, the headlines and, and, and the reviews of that game? That, that's the one John Fallon was in there. It's one of his best games for Celtic yeah we, that, that was the one we threw nothing each over there and get beat at home I think yeah, yeah I, I just that's that's a game and it's funny um, I knew what you were going to say when you said the t-shirts but uh, you, you weren't the only one to get caught out we, we went to see <laughs> we went to see Celtic in Valencia I think it was O'Neill's second season in the UEFA Cup we got the, the year we got robbed in the Champions League but yeah. Juventus that fucking yeah. A- Amoruso diving for the penalty and a referee called Helmut Klug from Germany. Uh, yeah. I don't know how his name still sticks in my head. But we, we, we went to Valencia, it was November, and it was a day charter from Bel- I think it was from Belfast. So we headed off. Now we bought rain jackets with us because we thought, you know, it might, be, it might rain. It rains a bit in Spain. <laughs> Jackie, I'm not telling you, right? I thought it was going to die up in, up in that old stadium, the mess or whatever you call it. Yeah. I thought my ears were going to fall off. I was fucking well, freezing. Well, you, the same uh, when we went to Barcelona. I can't remember what year it was. And like, I'd met Danny Riley and all them. And in the afternoon, we were sitting out in the patio having a drink. But at night, I think we could be one night. They scored early. Messi came on as a sub or played a wee bit. And... It was freezing. And a lot of Celtic supporters left at half time. 
Because I remember saying to Danny Riley, there was some of them left at half time. Danny went, I left at half time, he says. You couldn't get a seat in the subway for Celtic supporters, no? <laughs> but, Jackie, when I go to Barcelona now, I, I try to get a local to buy me a ticket because the last time I was there, I was up in the guards, but the weather was nice. It was when, yeah. under Brandon Rogers when they hammered us. But the time before that, I went with Shamie and Hilly and the boys and I think Hilly had been over to a gig a few weeks before and he ended up going to the stadium and buying tickets. And yeah. we, were in, we were in with all the old age pensioners behind the goals, up from the ultras. What a yeah. brilliant seats, right? We had coffee and buns and everything, right? And we were out of the stadium straight away. So when I go back to Barcelona now, Jackie, I will not be climbing them stairs again. I well, as be- I say, that time when we were there, uh, a lot of people were trying to buy the tickets that day and they wouldn't sell them to anybody with a British or Irish passport. But I had my son Michael with me and he was had his Canadian passport. And so he must have queued up Seven times for different people. The most he could get at a time was two, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'd say he thanked you for that. What a way to spend your day in Barcelona. Yeah. Right, so that's that's some great memories there, Jackie. And finally, from watching over in Canada or getting together with other clubs, you know, what, what sticks out? Because what sticks out for me is that, that first time you all got together to watch a game in yeah. Los Victoria. No, it was, in, it was in the Irish club and... Uh, Toronto. And yeah, that, was, that must uh, have been brilliant. Uh, uh, to, to make it even better was they were heavy favourites, right? And in the Irish club, they were out to make as much money as they could from it, which I don't blame them because it probably cost them a fortune. As I, as I say, they were the only place shown it. And we were up the stairs and all the rain supporters were down the stairs. And uh, the place was just humping from B. Joe scored and I always remember we came back to St. Catharines and we went into one of the pubs and there were a lot of range supporters in and oh how'd the game go and I love just rubbing into them saying oh he's went all over us all over us but it was one not for us <laughs> <laughs> right uh, on you go give me another one go on because I kind of coaxed you into that one because I wanted to hear a bit more about it well, well with uh, Foley and the team no just just from from over there because I, I have so many friends living abroad and now they, they can watch the games at home. Yeah, but nothing beats getting together with your mates. And the, the, if, if these lockdowns, I'm in a 5K lockdown still, and I can't wait to get together with the boys. Yeah, well, we went, even the last Celtic Rangers game, like the day after, we went from 10 in a pub to 50. But two weeks later, it looks as if we're going back into lockdown again. It's starting to climb again. So, But as I say, like, when, we got the, when we started getting the games regular, and the Celtic Rangers game would be a half seven in the morning kick off here. In our club, the bath built shut to two in the morning, right? So a lot of times you just shut the door and we'll just sleep in the, the benches to the, to the morning. And a lot of times the, the bath stayed open a wee bit. And I always remember uh, the cops came, two stories, right? One of the guys coming in the morning must have had a few drinks, stopped to get cigarettes and backed into a car at the store but then just took off and came to the club. So somebody spotted them, the cops came, and it was a bit, maybe about 15 minutes into the game, the cops come in and he says, right, who owns this car? Nobody, nobody's admitting, right? And he says, there was a young cop and an old cop, and I always remember it. The, the young cop says, look, if a guy doesn't own up in the next 10 minutes, I'll be pulling the, pl- the plug in that signal. And a wee guy in our club, wee Jimmy Laughlin, says to the old cop, tell him, he pull his gun before he pulls a plug. <laughs> 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 and then another one was, uh, it was a Celtic Rangers, a league cup tie. And we, at that time, it was the big satellites, you know, the big massive ones. And we had one on the roof of the club. And we kept getting interference, losing the picture. And then we lost the picture altogether. And somebody says, it's that wind and that tree outside's blown across my signal. So me and another guy went out, climbed into the woman's garden and cut down the tree. And then when we came, and when we came back in, uh, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy McNeil says this, Jackie, did you just cut down that tree? I went, aye. He says, the reason we lost the second was the plug came out the back of the telly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, unreal. Like some, of the, some of the stories. And as you say, like Celtic have done a lot of touring since we've been over here too. And... I think it was when we played Liverpool in Connecticut. There was myself, John Rose from Bramalee, and 
I believe it was Tony Green for San Francisco, uh, for LA. And we'd went out for a drink in uh, Hartford or whatever it was, no, Connecticut. So we'd come out of the pub maybe about 2 30 in the morning and we're walking back to the hotel. And the next thing, boom, the cop lights, cars come on, and the guy pulls up beside us, says, Where are you going? He says, They're the hot hotel up here. And we told him to name it. And he says, Get in the back of this car. He says, I carry a gun and I wouldn't walk through this neighborhood. <laughs> 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 but as I say, like the best, the best thing is the people we met and became friends with me. Honestly, that's and that's not just me saying it. That's people from all over. Like they've made friends at the maybe made friends at the convention in '96 or 2000, and they're still very friendly with the same people now yeah. and stay in contact with them. It's funny that um, you're so busy with the helping out the, the boys. I know you've stood down, but you're still you're still involved, you know, and you're so busy and everyone wants to talk and, you know, the players and everyone wants to be accommodated. But I have a lovely memory of we bumped into each other in the airport on the way home. Two conventions I, ago, I believe. I can down to stay in New York, New York, and actually do a bit of Vegas with Sandra yeah, after actually, the convention. Actually, see, see something, no? <laughs> yeah, so we, we we went and done. It was strange. You know, it's the first time I was ever sitting in a hotel room, and my wife went by me outside the hotel room, but sixteen stories up in a roller coaster. So that doesn't yeah. happen every day because <laughs> um, I wasn't going on a, a big big coward. But but we 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 sat waiting for our flight that day, Jackie. I think we, in Burger King, cup of coffee, and I suppose I got more in that conversation, with you in an yeah, hour. because I'm actually get paid to sit and talk. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and you know, you're just talking, and you're not, you're just talking life, really. You know, you're talking, obviously, you're talking Celtic, but you're talking bits and pieces, and it, it was, it was lovely conversation, especially, especially when you're first delayed. <laughs> yeah, well, you look at that, like, as well as all the enjoyment of gained out of this, I also gained a son-in-law and two grandchildren. Right? <laughs> that's that's the new frontier for you. That's them cowboys. Yeah. All right, well, as I say, Tommy met Lindsay, 2000, and they've been to every convention. My grandkids have been to every convention there. I mean, as I say, Kiva went to her first one in the pram, and the last one, she was drinking. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, look, they all grow up because the, the first one I went to, Jackie, Connor, yeah. wasn't, Connor wasn't even one. He was he was, he, he was was one a couple of weeks after we got back to the I think yeah, that first week in June. He was he's the he's he's the twentieth of June, and um, the first one we went to Jackie. I'll just finish uh, on this because I, this is probably my worst Vegas memory. Because I remember <laughs> people saying, "Oh, you're leaving your son to go away," and we said, "Yeah, we're going to Las Vegas." But I'd been on the drink for a couple of days, Jackie. Yeah, and I couldn't get out of bed, and I said to Sandra, "I said, look, I need to see a doctor. I'm really, really sick. I, you know, I've, I poisoned myself." So she says, no bother. So we we jumped in a taxi. We were, we were staying downtown. We jumped in a taxi. It was a Chinese taxi driver. She said to him, we'll bring us to, to a doctor's, you know, and he got, he didn't speak that much English. So she said, like a clinic or a chemist. So he said, yeah. So he, he brought us to a clinic and get out of the taxi and we went in. And at this stage, Zaki, I, I'm, I'm in a bad way. At this stage, you know, I'm, my stomach's going every way. It's the way yeah. I wanted to go. So she walks up, she walks up, there's a nurse at reception and she walks up and she says, look, your husband's been drinking a lot and he's really, really dehydrated and really sick. You know, can, could he see a doctor? And she says, ma'am, this is a plastic surgery clinic. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up, we ended up walking about a mile and we found a chemist and they looked after me and within a, within a day I was back in action. But yeah, that was, that was one of my early Vegas memories, Jackie. So, you know, it wasn't all it wasn't all high rolling and glitz and glamour. Oh, for sure. As I say, like, some of the things you think, well, maybe I shouldn't have done that. But going back to the '94, the Hamilton Cup, and it was Celtic Aberdeen and that there we were playing. But my my son Michael, he made his confirmation that day, and I wasn't there because I was away to the game. So some of the things. <laughs> Some of the things you like you regret. No. Well, I don't know how you got away with that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always remember my, my best pal over here, Frank Tracy, says to me, Jackie, that's fucking ridiculous. It's your boy's confirmation. You should be there. And my answer to him was, well, Frank, 
I wasn't the one that stood for get christened saying I'd bring him up in the Catholic faith. That was his godfather, who I believe's you. <laughs> <laughs> Jackie, Jackie, it's been absolutely brilliant getting your take on Vegas and sharing your memories from, I suppose, from the nine in a row, first time round, standing on the terraces, travelling everywhere to see Celtic, being frozen in, in Milan when you thought you were you know, going to get a bit of sunshine, <laughs> to, to moving to Canada, listening, listening to the games on a transistor radio, and your brother on the phone telling you stuff yeah. right through to what the North American Supporters Association have achieved, the conventions. Tommy Conlon going over and becoming your, your son-in-law, you know, yeah. your grandchildren carrying in the flag. It's been brilliant, Jackie, and there's can hopefully I, can, many more years to come. Yeah, can I just say one thing? The one thing that's annoying me about this year is, and even some Celtic supporters, this will be the team that's remembered for losing the 10. In my memory, they'll be remembered for one in the nine. But Joe Steen was the remembered for losing the ten. Walter Smith was the remembered for losing the ten. So why would this team be remembered for losing the ten? That's just press talk and stupid Celtic supporters buy into it. Here, here, Jackie, well said. Well said. Nine in a row and a quadruple treble. It's not exactly. Bad, like, that's what they'll be remembered for. No losing the ten. Yeah. And history, history can't rewrite itself. No, no. As I say, you listen to these papers and now, and, but the question, can Rangers match Celtic? What do Rangers need to do to match Celtic's unbeaten season? And the best answer i seen with that was a guy saying, what do they need? A fucking time machine. So <laughs> <laughs> and they're not getting into my one, Jackie. <laughs> okay then, right. Listen, Malaysia, Jackie, as I said, it's been an absolute pleasure. Okay, it's been a pleasure, Malish. And I say to you, I don't know how I'll find time to talk for Half an hour, well, it's a wee bit longer than half an hour. That, that was two days ago. <laughs> It was great to chat to Jackie without having him being pulled and dragged around a casino in Las Vegas to saw something out. Great to see the North American supporters see him doing so well. And not only the Federation, but all the supporters clubs who make it up. And some of them hold their own events like the Playboys Fail in Philly or Brock McVeigh's Friday Sessions in the Bronx. Lads, I can't wait to get back stateside to see us all and all the crews gathering from around the world. It's going to be one hell of a party. Can you imagine the pool party? Thanks to everyone who bought issue 114 of More Than 90 Minutes. Print edition is now available, as is the digital one, and there's less than 40 copies left. So thank you so much. With no match day sales, there would be no print edition without your continued support of the old school print edition. And I'd like to thank Kieran Kenny, one of our contributors. He just sent me a lovely message the other day. I'll keep it private, but you know what? It lifted me spirits. Thanks, Kieran. And as always, I have to thank the professionalism of my good pal Ronan McQuillan for producing the show. He does walk with some amateurs, so he's delighted to be walking with this big amateur here today. <laughs> <laughs> and I know he'll be cutting all that out. And it was lovely to see some uh, comments coming in today about his performance of the Fields of Matt and Roy with his friends. And that's also going to be our play out tune for Selig AM this week. So don't forget to check us out. And folks, if you like what we're doing and you would like to support us, you can do so by visiting CelticFanzine.com where you can become a member, subscribe, buy or donate for the price of a pint. Don't forget to visit the website for articles and news, including David Potter's weekend long read. And you can also sign up for our newsletter or check out our bonus podcasts, which are coming next week and our podcast shorts, which we're kicking off again. Please download our app, it's free, and you'll have access to all our podcast articles, daily news, video content, events, the fanzine, and our online shop, all at the touch of a button on your phone or tablet. All episodes of the podcast are now available across all platforms, so hit that subscribe or follow button and you'll never miss an episode. You can leave a review, but if you're leaving one, make sure it's a good one. And finally... After a year, Celtic AM returns, well, virtually anyway, on Celtic Fanzine TV, which is great to get it back up and running again. And I have to welcome Daniel Faulkner to the team. He's going to look after and produce our video content. And everyone will know how big of an amateur I am, so it's great to be surrounded by professionals. And talking about professionals, a special mention to Aaron Boyle, who's also been helping us out. Thank you so much, Aaron. Don't forget to follow us, folks, on social media. You can get us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn. And all the details will be in the podcast description. 
And once again, folks, if your selling minded business or selling supporters club or rich uncle or auntie would like to support the podcast and the fanzine and would like to become a sponsor, please email us at info at sellingfanzine.com. And you can also contact us through the website or message us on all those social media platforms. And if you enjoyed the conversation with today's guest, Jackie Meaton, and would like to listen to some more of the same, can I suggest episode 31 when actor Gianni Capaldi joined us from his home in Las Vegas. Dubliner Johnny Vaughan spoke to us back in episode 40 and 41 about life stateside and following Celtic from afar. And as did Belfast native Charlie Laud, who spoke to us from his home in Philadelphia in episode 51 and way back in episode 4 when Bobby Petter also joined us to talk Celtic from a Dutch perspective. I'm really looking forward to the Scottish Cup game and a fresh start in a fresh competition. Let's hope we see the rebirth of some of our underperforming players and we won't have a cup shock like we had when Roy Keane made his debut. I still have nightmares about that day and I still have nightmares about a player from China called Do We. Do we need a centre-half? We did then and maybe we still do. Well, folks, thanks for listening to me rambling on. Thanks for supporting us. Stay safe. Keep the faith. And this week, we'll play out once again with the Blanding Pilgrims and Paddy and me. Uh, my name is McLean. I was born in Kerfin. Been in Boston since I was a boy. I'm a chippy by trade. And I work night and day. For a dear friend of mine, Paddy Hoy. In the morning you see. Well, Paddy and me. We'll go down to Ned Kelly's bar Where the drinks will flow free They've got satellite TV Coming all the way from Celtic Park Before the game starts The bar it is packed And the colours are all green and white We put on the TV and we all stream to see The names on the banners so bright There's an almighty shout For one that stands out Nave Padrick CSC But though we all cheer And laugh in our beer There's a sadness in Paddy and me some say the world's getting smaller Emigration's no longer so bad But sometimes cheap flights and phone calls at night Just make you feel more sad The game it is done We done it, we won And Paddy and me sink a glass Through all selfie we go With our colours on show A pint in each bar that we pass But now and again Our thoughts they return to the faces we saw on TV For behind all the cheers With tonight's lonely tears There's a sadness in Paddy and me